Okay, perfect. Um, first of all, um, I am very grateful to the ICGB for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Thank you so much um, for the interest and the time you're taking to, to listen to our story here from Tanzania. And what I would like to explain to you is how over the last 15 years and 10 years with the charity, but five years before that, we have managed to create <clears throat> um, a national children's cancer service in Tanzania. And I think the overriding lesson that we've learned from this, the take home is don't wait until everything's perfect. You visit um, international research trials we, we have, um, but I thought the background and the clinical care is also important to explain to you. So I'll go through that quickly. So as any of you who know anything about children's cancer, um, you will know, and cancer in general, you will know that in the 1940s, if you couldn't cut it out, um, you died of your cancer. But what has happened since then, and I'm sorry, this graph only goes up to 2000, obviously 20 years of further development um, have further improved the, the survival of patients to the point now that children with any sort of cancer have at least an 80% chance of cure. And for some uh, leukemia patients, they have up to a 95% chance of cure. So the paradigm has completely reversed which is really extraordinary. This I believe has also happened in adults as well, um, a slightly slower trajectory, partly because the tumors are more resistant to the traditional chemo. And I think also partly because at the very beginning, the, um, the pediatricians shared all of their work and they built on each other's, on each other's successes, which was a real, um, uh, some, something that, that everybody has learned from. The problem, however, of course, is that these successes are not universal. And um, certainly when I came to Tanzania in 2006, um, we were seeing very, very low survivals, um, which is just really, I believe, unacceptable. You know, this phrase 2022 and everybody should be at the high. I am Irish. Um, and so I am very much uh, uh, driven by uh, some of the, my, my forefathers and particularly maybe this man, um, Dennis Burkett, who I believe is maybe one of our most extraordinary experts, experts and exports. Um, and he was a man who went to Uganda in the 50s and was one of the very first in the whole world to prove that lymphoma was curable um, with single and then double agent chemotherapy. Um, and he did this by having friends around the world. Apparently some friends of his from the, the National Cancer Institute smuggled some chemo in for him. And uh, he was able to prove that for a small proportion of children with his eponymous Burkitt's lymphoma, Uh, the cancer with um, very little. In that East Africa, 50s when this all began, um, and for many, many years, East Africa and Africa in general has been left behind. And that really needed to change. And I'm happy that I'm here to show you how that has begun to change in the last 10 or 15 years. And um, the other thing that Dennis Burkett did was he was a great advocate for, um, uh, for uh, Oh, what's it called? Pu uh, public health. Um, and uh, would often ask his medical students and junior doctors if they would prefer to be a floor mopper upper or a tap turner offer. So this man um, has had uh, influence in many, many fields of medicine. He's an extraordinary human being. So as I said, part of the reason that things aren't changing is people don't feel they can change. There's an awful lot of um, inertia, I think, because people are like, well, how can you do it? It's too expensive. There's too many hurdles. Whereas I don't agree that. I, I don't at all agree. I think um, this is a, a graph that if you know Hans Rosling's work, and if you don't, please look him up. He has the most extraordinary TED Talks. Um, he shows in this animated graph that everybody is moving towards the upper part of this graph up here, which is the healthier, wealthier part of the graph. And there's no reason why we couldn't gallop in that direction. We just need a bit of focus and a bit of belief. <clears throat> so when people ask me about uh, childhood cancer services in Africa, they often say, but why when there's still so many more important diseases and problems in health in Africa? And you could say that that's true. There's still a lot of um, communicable diseases and malnutrition and you know, poverty related issues. But what I have found and what I argue um, is that if you concentrate on 
creating and developing a, a quality childhood cancer service or cancer service in general, well, you're lifting all boats. Um, basically, our service cannot stand alone and is not a parallel service. It is embedded in the, in the hospital in, and in all the hospitals that we work in. And it relies, we rely on all of our colleagues, whether they're surgeons or radiologists or pharmacists or nursing or the lab in general, pathology, if they are not functioning, we cannot do our job. And so by, um, it, by creating a cancer service, you're, you're basically uh, spending a lot of time supporting each and every one of these different departments so that they also support um, other services and other conditions um, with their improvements. So it's, it's, it's a very good, if you have a functioning cancer service, you have a functioning health service. So just to give you a very brief understanding of where we started, this is the Ocean Road Cancer Institute, absolutely beautiful location in the Indian Ocean, built in the 1890s um, as a fever hospital and in the 50s or 60s was, uh, was maternity and then in the 80s became a cancer hospital. We had one little ward. It had 17 beds, it had one electricity socket in the wall, and it had nothing else. There was no oxygen, there was really no room. You had to turn sideways to move between the, between the beds. We had one doctor and we had free drugs for Burkitt's lymphoma, which was uh, the one condition that was offered free to the children at the time. However, there was strong political will in that the, the Tanzanian government had declared that they were going to try and provide cancer services free, not just for children, but for all patients. And indeed, if you came to Ocean Road Hospital, the treatment was free. The problem was for large chunks of the year, the cupboards were bare. And at that point, the parents and the families and the patients were asked to go and buy the drugs. And as a result, um, we looked at the very short term survival of new patients from 2005. So this was April 2006 that this, this little report was done. And as you can see, the only children who had any chance of survival is this small pink column here which at that point was 12%. And you can then imagine if you follow those kids for, for the year or two, that this will definitely reduce. So, and the other part of this is, this was about 120 new children seen in 2005. Whereas we would pr have predicted at that time, there was 3000 children in the country. And therefore in real terms, there was less than 5% overall survival and probably zero, closer to 0% survival, which is just really unacceptable at this time point uh, in the world. When we know how to do it, we know how to cure these kids. It just has to happen. So this is the ward that we started. And as I say, it was not beautiful. Um, and there was a lot lacking, but if you don't start with something, you're going to be waiting and waiting until there's no sweet point, you know, you just have to start. And what happened was we went from having one child on each of the beds and 17 kids admitted to on our very, very busiest day, we had 90, nine zero children admitted in this 17 bedded ward. They were three to a bed, they were under the bed, they were sleeping outside. It was awful, except that they were all getting treatment. So really like hell for them to live, but the parents were willing to accept it because the treatment was happening. And what was the change? Well, one day on the ward, I just said all the chemotherapy was going to be free of charge. I didn't actually have any way of paying for it, but we ordered the chemo and crossed our fingers and hoped for the best. And the children started getting better. And what was lucky was then visitors came in and said, well, what's going on here? And they would, I would hand them receipt or uh, invoices and they would go to pharmacies and pay the receipts. So that's how we started, like completely seat of the pants kind of stuff. And the, uh, the inspiration for all of that came from the Burkitt lymphoma study. So the reason that Burkitt lymphoma treatment was free at the, when I arrived and I was already making great progress was because a, a study, a, a multi-center study um, had been initiated and, and uh, Ocean Road had been one of the centers. And with very little education, um, uh, one doctor and three nurses and, a, and a, the, the appropriate chemotherapy, which cost between 100, between 50 and $120 for, per, per entire treatment for the children. So really, really not expensive treatment. They managed to improve survival from less than 10% to more than 70% um, in three years. 
So that was for me the proof of concept. These these children could receive good care, um, and the doctors and the nurses had the skills and the wherewithal to do this. It was really you can't cure cancer if you don't have chemo. You just, I mean, what are you supposed to do? So. I'm going to flash forward, don't worry, I'm not going to go through 15 years year by year, but I'm just going to summarize now what has changed. So we've gone from literally almost nothing to now. And so our summary of successes are that we now have survival rates of over 50%. Um, the number of children that we see annually has risen from 120 in 2005 to more than 730 last year. We have free chemotherapy for every single child in the network. And by the network, we have the National Children's Cancer Network. We don't have one site anymore. We have 11 sites. We are hoping to have 30 sites around, around the country because that would mean that no child was more than a four-hour journey from um, a site, not necessarily a treatment site, but a, tr a site in the network that knows what to do. It might be just a stabilize and transfer site, but all of that would speed up the access for the children to quality care and reduce this late presentation that we're seeing still so frequently. And then in terms of cost, because when people think oncology, they think massive costs. But actually, there was a study published a number of years ago where they looked at the cost of leukemia treatment in Europe and they, they estimated the, 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 the costs in various different countries and where was the cheapest and most expensive. Well, the cheapest is in Finland. And the cost is about, I think it was 103,000 euros per child. And so the cost of 730 children receiving the treatment that we give them was equivalent to seven children with leukemia in, in the cheapest country in Europe. So I don't accept the argument that what we're doing is not cost effective. I think it is very effective. So as I said, I am the executive director of a charity called Tumani La Maisha here in Tanzania. And in Europe, it is called Their Lives Matter. Um, I'm also um, here in Moimbili as a pediatric oncologist. So I have kind of two hats. And then to look, how did we make those changes? How did we move from nobody surviving to more than 50% of the children surviving? And how did we move? How did we increase the number of kids coming to us sevenfold and rising? Um, well, the first thing is we moved the children from Ocean Road, that little shed where there was literally nothing, to the children's camps or to the children's department in the largest government hospital, um, Moongili National Hospital. We did that 10 years ago or 11 years ago now, I think. Um, and that immediately opened up more services to the children. We had piped oxygen, we had surgeons upstairs, we had an emergency department, we had a 24 hour lab, none of which we had before. And the CT MRI was offered free of charge. Muimili National Hospital is an extraordinary hospital. I don't know if any of you have ever visited Tanzania or Dar es Salaam. Um, it doesn't always get great press, but it deserves good press. It has kept everything that they have available free of charge to children with cancer, um, no matter where they come from, which is really amazing. We now have a 65 bedded ward instead of the 17 one we originally had. And we have also built a 22 bedded hostel so that families from all over the country, if they need to stay with us for the duration of their treatment, they don't have to stay on the ward the whole time and they don't have to pay for their own accommodation. We also have a wonderful nutrition program. So we have built our own so that children who come very malnourished have a range of products that we make fresh every day. It is fresh whole foods. So we have a coconut based F100, we have protein balls, we have uh, we have 100 litres of smoothie that's made every day and we have a multigrain high energy porridge um, and all of these are made fresh every single day and, and each child is assessed individually for the nutritional needs. We also have some social stuff, we have play, we have school um, so that the children have some fun when they are living with us. Um, and another very important part of breaking down the delays in presentation is we now transport the patients. So if we get a contact from a, a hospital far away from us, we can use mobile money to send the bus fare for the family to come to us so that they don't have to have that cost. We're also paying for health insurance for every child. And we feel that that's important, even though when they come to us at Moonbili, the there are no costs to the family and um, when they go home and if they were having you know their maintenance treatment or if the plan is very straightforward and we started here we can move them back to one of our sites the sites are not always free but if they have the government health insurance card then things are free for them so that's a very important part breaking down financial barriers is key we also built a 12 bedded PICU for the hospital in general and um, along with an NICU uh, just because we like to share when we have donors we like to share it with the hospital and with other departments we obviously benefit from 
from that um, because we now have a, an ICU for our children as well. But it also means that Moon Billy is, is very proud and also feels that the pediatric department, pediatric oncology department is um, is a, of benefit to the, the wider public or the wider uh, community in, in the hospital. In the laboratory then, we have, uh, for the last 10 years, we can do our own local flow cytometry, leukemia diagnostics. And in the last uh, three years, we can do pathology, immune histochemistry. So we've been slowly, slowly building up these services. Prior to this, I've been very fortunate and my colleagues where I trained in Ireland were doing all of the pathology and leukemia diagnostics for all the children with cancer in Tanzania. At a point um, in time, the Irish pathology department and hematology department were seeing more kids with cancer from Tanzania than from Ireland. And they are a single site in it, seeing all the kids in Ireland as well. So it was really extraordinary that they were offering the service free of charge. Um, also, we've, we've concentrated on training. So um, I wrote a, an MSc in pediatric hematology oncology and had it approved in the university. It's now being run um, by some of our colleagues with Global Hope through a fellowship, but it's the same, it's the same course and, and the same permissions. Um, we also have surgical support and surgical training trips that happen annually. Mm -hmm. um, we have an intensive uh, hematology oncology nurse training course for pediatrics. And we have visitors who come and teach all sorts of different emergency life support training. We also have a pharmacist who comes and does oncology training with, with the team every year as well. So we've lots of training and these are visitors come, the center picture is of our entire And um, as you can We have clown doctors and they're very important and we also have kind of kindergartens and there is here Hilda is creating the welcome pack so every family gets a welcome pack on arrival with toothbrush and toothpaste and thermometers and all sorts of bits and pieces that they might need for life on the ward because we assume they come with nothing because most of them do. We also have a skills room for the parents because obviously if the children live with us for months then so do their parents and so we teach them skills um, that they can take home with them whether it's sewing or beading or um, some uh, health life lessons and things like that so all sorts of stuff is going on this these are our first two graduates from the msc and um, dr laity the lady there she is the now the unit head here in wing billy and dr shakilu the, the the man is the head in dodoma which is the capital of uh, tanzania and he's he's the he's the chief uh, pediatrician and pediatric oncologist in dodoma so we've we and we we know we, I think we have three in year one and year two, and we're having another intake this year of nine new fellows. So it's really building up and ramping up. So it's a very important part of what we do. Another thing that we realized is we need good data. And in order to get good data, we need to have a good data. It's like a hospital. It's very comprehensive. Um, and the good thing about it is what we have done is we have built it to share with all of the sites around the country that we are working with. Um, so our National Children's Cancer uh, network colleagues. So a child could start in one of the other centers, for example, in Mbeya, and then when they move to our site, we can we can search for their number, find them in Mbeya, and then we can import all of their hospital uh, data from Mbeya into our center, which allows, this allows us to see what scans the kid has had, what treatment they've had, um, and so on. And then in reverse, the same thing. So when they go back, so they can see exactly what's happened to the child was um, what we call the Clever Chemo Program. So um, the, 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 on the far left here is the written uh, chemotherapy prescription sheet. And as you can see, there's boxes, but there's literally no prompts. So you have to know everything. You have to know the protocol. You have to know the calculations. You have to know what diluent is used, what rate, what route, all of that you need to know. Um, whereas we found that when we reviewed that, that there was probably errors in every single written uh, handwritten sheet. It's very laborious. There's so many inputs that are required and it's so prone to human error. So what we did as an interim was we built about, uh, I think we have 13 um, Excel sheets that are individualized for different treatment, different cancers. Um, and the only thing now that you have to fill in um, that in that middle sheet are the yellow boxes. Everything else is automated. So you choose the right sheet. You need to know a little bit about the child's weight and height and how they are, some of their blood tests, 
Um, and literally that's it. The rest of it will be automated. And that has transformed prescribing chemo from a very error prone and, and dangerous process to a very safe and easy and actually pleasant process. It used to be a nightmare writing all these chemo sheets and now uh, it, it, it's effortless and it takes seconds. It is still, it still requires multiple checks, which is very important. Um, and the one problem with Excel, as I'm sure everybody knows having used Excel is it's easy to modify it incorrectly. Um, and if one of the cells get modified in a bad way, this can make nonsense of the sheet. So we're very cautious about rolling that out. And instead what we're doing is building a web-based version of it. Um, and that will take all the clever stuff away from the, um, the user, um, but still give them the functionality. So that's where we're at. We should have that up and running by the end of the year. So quickly, we also have awareness campaigns. We have a general awareness campaign called our Helpful Campaign, which is for children's cancer in general. And then we also have um, a retinoblastoma awareness campaign, which we are rolling out and we're partnering with some of the radio and television stations. So what we do then is we put all of these things that we have created into a box. Um, and then we offer these things free of charge. Everything we do is open, not exactly open source because some of the things are dangerous to be open source. But if we partner with a new site, we give them all of the products that we've created, whether it's uh, our parents' handbook or whether it's the Clever Cancer Care Program um, or anything that we have, we will give free of charge to any site who wants to partner with us. And we encourage anyone to get in contact with us if they are interested in any of our products. The idea is not in any way to restrict it, but to have as many people um, getting safe care as possible. So just briefly, who do we see? Well, the most common is leukemia. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to tell whether it's leukemia lymphoma, the usual symptoms and signs. We um, have uh, both ALL and AML. And what we have just recently discovered with a study that we've just, um, we've just, we're still going through, it hasn't been published yet, is what we were seeing was children were dying in remission induction right at the very beginning in the first five weeks of treatment. And what we have found now, which I think is a unique problem maybe to, uh, to resource limited settings, is that the children are no longer dying in the first seven or eight months, which is the heavy treatment. They're now dying in maintenance because the families go home thousands of kilometers away and are not continuing their treatment. So we're a bit stunned by that, but it's, it's important, as I say, the, the importance about research is that you know the problem so that you can fix it, even if it's not a problem you anticipated. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a very important disease that we see. Um, this is a child who has Burkitt's lymphoma. As you can see there from the first photo, you would imagine just give this child some morphine and let him die. What, are, what is the point in torturing him with chemo? And a week later, how incredible he looks and how um, the disease has almost completely melted. And then a month later, even though he has three months of treatment, he looks completely back to normal. So that's the message is... If for for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's almost never too late. So long as so long as we can get the chemo into them and they don't get bad tumor lysis, these children can do extremely extremely well. And as I say, the treatment costs between fifty and one hundred and twenty dollars per child. So it's really cost effective. And um, we see lots of Hodgkin's kids. Interestingly, um, in, in Europe and North America, the the, the two um, peaks are in the teenage years, and I think in the fifth decade. We also have a peak under 10. Um, and that is, I think, because of the early acquisition of the Epstein-Barr virus. So we do see children under 10, which would be almost vanishingly rare um, in other parts of the world. They also do extremely well. Our retinoblastoma kids um, are a large chunk of the kids that we see. About 15% of the kids we see have retinoblastoma. It's a very sad disease because in Europe, in Ireland, where I'm from, 100% of the children survive and can often save their eyes. And in fact, oncologists rarely see them. They're managed on, a, on an ophthalmology uh, service. Whereas here, um, although we've been battling very, very hard, when I came first, it was about a 25% survival. It's now up to close to 60%. That's nowhere near 100. So there's a lot more we need to do about getting the message out there because the problem here is their early signs are not very scary. A white pupil, a little bit of a red eye, a squint doesn't terrify people. Although the parents tend to look for help, but they, it's not pain and it's not, they may have lost their vision, but they're too young to tell you that. So these children tend to present to us late, even now. Wilms tumor is very common and we regularly see, I think, maybe about 40% of our children are metastatic who have Wilms tumor, but they still do pretty well. We have about a 65% survival from our Wilms kids. So it's, it's definitely worth treating even when they're very advanced. And that's one of the keys here. And this is just an example of showing you how advanced these things can be and how well the children are. So this is a little boy. This is his Wilms tumor here, very large, but the other part of it is this, his tumor, 
left his minion on right of the bid right bench ball. Nothing thing that is his tumor so a massive lump his belly gone right up into his heart um and yet what we were able to do was give him pre-operative chemo get two teams one opened him from his neck down to his uh, sternum and the other uh, below his sternum and the other one opened up his belly one took the tumor out of his kidney one took his kidney out and took the tumor out of his belly and tracked it up to his liver and the other put him on bypass to opened his heart and put the, took the tumor out and he is alive and this was him only 10 days postoperatively. You can see there his little uh, sternotomy scar from, from the surgery. So a massive surgery um, done here locally in Wimbley Hospital. And this child is long ago gone home. This is like maybe five years ago. And he comes into us once a year and is perfectly well. So you can see the progress that has been made in the services that we provide. Uh, interestingly, we don't see so many brain tumors, even though that would be the number one diagnosis in other parts of the world. We think probably because they're being misdiagnosed. We do see them. They tend to be very advanced when they come to us. Um, so we, it's not that we feel that they there are less brain tumors here, but it's that you need a, you need a scan to diagnose brain tumor. You don't need a scan for almost any other cancer. Eventually, somebody will think of it, but you need a CT or an MRI of the brain in order to, do, to diagnose brain tumors. So then just to quickly tell you what we're planning. So we want to get to every child. Kilomototo means every child, every child in the country. Um, and how are we going to do this? Well, with this four tiered system, we're starting in Dar es Salaam, which is the Caternary hub. Um, and that is where um, the plan comes from and where we offer the support to all of the other sites. Um, we pool, the, we procure the chemotherapy and then supply it to all the sites around the country. Um, we really also will do second look pathology um, for any child in the country free of charge. As I say, we really is a wonderful partner. Um, and we also manage the education of all the sites around the country um, and the various different uh, other sports we provide. The uh, tertiary centers are the university sites around the country. And over time, we are hoping that they will all become green. At the moment, what you see there are all the university hospitals, but not all of them are green. Um, and that's something we need to, we need to build. Um, and once they are green, it means that they can treat every childhood cancer in the country. Uh, sorry, every childhood cancer. Um, they might need some specialist care, like with, you know, neurosurgery or cardiac surgery, but otherwise they they treat they treat themselves. Second level sites we have plenty, and they are sites who are basically um, treating some cancers, but knowing their limits and then referring the children who are um, beyond what they are capable of. And we have a number of sites doing that, which is really very helpful because it allows us as well to start a child's treatment, do the intensive stuff and then send the child back to them with a plan and they can continue things. Primary sites are equally as important. These are sites that um, see the children first. They're smaller centers and they um, stabilize and once they recognize what's going on, stabilize, contact us, and we help them transfer the child safely and rapidly to a site, not necessarily to us in Dar es Salaam, but a site close to them where the treatment can be offered. How do we do it? We're lucky we have partners with DHL. They will move chemotherapy around the country for us and samples back to us. And, and, and that is extremely helpful. They do that free of charge. And then we actually just use the bus service most of the time to move the children if they need to come. And we use um, mobile money. So all the different um, mobile technologies here have means of uh, sending money um, and that allows the bus tickets to be bought. We ask that various level sites to do different things. For a level one participation, all you have to do is participate and ring us if you see a child and we'll help you. For level two and three, we do ask that they come on a call once a week and they keep our shared database, the Clever, Clever Charts database, uh, up to date so that we can all see what's going on with the children and that it's it's a specific number of, uh, of staff who look after the service um, and follow up the patients. And they don't use their own protocols. They must use the national protocols, which have been agreed by national uh, a, a national meeting with um, all oncologists available uh, to, to put them together about five years ago. Um, and they have to obviously, if they're going to keep the kids they, and they want us to help with diagnosis, they have to be able to take the samples and send them to us. And that's it. And we give them uh, all of the chemotherapy they need, all of the antibiotics they need, um, any specialist needles, any palliative care drugs they need. We will do the diagnostics for them. We will help with, and we, we also provide health insurance cards for, for their children. They don't have to come to us to get that access. And if they need transport, uh, regionally we'll also help with that and we also help them with lots and lots of training 
And this is what it will look like. So at the moment, uh, well, in 2015, as you can see, the green sites were the sites that we had covered within four hours. Um, and what we're hoping to in 2025 is have the, the 30 sites. Um, and as you can see, there's still red areas, but actually most of those red areas are game parks where there's almost no people. So that would cover 98% of the population if we had those sites. And that's where we're aiming for. So then quickly, just to give you an idea of the research we've been involved in. So we have um, four studies that we are either starting or close to starting. And um, the AI Real um, study is a liquid knife study, um, which I will talk about in a minute, which is um, comparing liquid knife diagnostics to biopsies for lymphomas. We also have a rituximab study where we realize that um, there has been work I know in elderly people where um, they can't um, they can tolerate the intensive treatments for um, acute, acute lymphomas um, that they have given them like an RCHOP kind of regimen. And that has proven to be very effective in adults. It would be hard to do that study in, in children because they are already getting 95% survival. And if you, if you tried a lesser chemotherapy and add in rituximab and you got fewer survival, and um, that would actually obviously not be ethically appropriate. Whereas we have not had access to either intensive treatment protocols or rituximab recently, uh, until recently. And so now what we're doing is we're, we're adding rituximab to our treatment, our, our, our kind of easy treatment for Burkitt's lymphoma. And we're currently looking to see if it makes any difference. We also are part of the Orbi network, which is uh, uh, a global network for retinoblastoma and they we do a lot of uh, collaborative research and it's very simple research just looking at, at stats and what's going on in the world because they represent I think it's something like 70 or 80 percent of the, the the services in the world that look after children with cancer that it's really incredible the work that they've been able to publish on kind of general trends. The Salama study has just started, I think, yesterday. Um, we've been working on the ethics for ages. Um, and this is basically Salama stands. Uh, oh, what does Salama stand for? Anyway, the idea is it's um, it's looking at the um, whole exome sequencing of children's uh, leukemia, um, acute leukemia. And this has never been done in East Africa. So the results of this should be very exciting. So as you see there, oh, there it is. Studying acute leukemia mutations in Africa. That's what Salama stands for. Salama is also a greeting here in Tanzania and it means well. So it's, it's a nice word to use for this. Um, and the nice thing about the AI real study and the Salama study is if we find with the genetic study um, that there are specific, because this obviously is just going to be a time point, uh, a quick snapshot on what is happening for um, this particular group of leukemia patients and what their genetics look like. But what we have talked about with the um, the Oxford group, which is the AI real group, is that if we find specific um, genetic mutations or changes that, that are common in our children, that they will create um, a liquid knife test that will be specific for our kids going forwards. So it's, it's, it means that we will have, um, we will have a real clinical um, uh, improvement and, and powerful tool um, because of these two studies. Um, they're using the nanopore technology in the um, in the AI real study, um, and then as I said, we had a, we, the other thing that we've just done is a very simple uh, re retrospective review of our outcomes for acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, for five years, and we were very disappointed with the results, but very grateful that we know about them now. The children are surviving the heavy treatment, but a, a, a proportion of children much bigger than we, we had anticipated are dying in maintenance. So the next thing is trying to figure out how do we clinically impact that? How do we map the country so that every child who goes home to whatever village um, has a way of having a full blood count uh, every one to two weeks and can report to us and we can tell them how, what drugs they need to do for the next two, two and a half years. So it seems that sometimes the easier treatments, just tablets, but for two, two and a half years is actually more complex because of the vastness of the country and the, and the poverty of, of some of our patients um, than these heavy intensive treatment protocols that we're flying through now and having no problems with the children surviving. So what I wanted to show you was this is um, where we've come from 20, uh, so 2005 to 2022. As you can see, those who've received care, care and those who have cured, who we have cured, have really, really dramatically improved. But not to sit on our laurels, because what I want you to understand is statistics can lie. So what's more important is what we think is out there. And if you put that in context, 
we're doing well, though we're not anywhere near where we need to be. We think there are 4,000 children out there every year getting cancer. And that is why we need to um, expand our network, do better with the kids we see, also also see more children and, and treat more kids. And as I say, what Tumayla Maisha is doing and what Mumbili is doing is trying to remove the barriers in terms of finances um, from the families who are trying to access our service because the families are trying to come, they get they get stuck along the way is what we've realized. So what's happening in Tanzania is extraordinary. I There's a lot of sites around East Africa that are excellent, but there's no country, uh, none of our neighbors are trying to do joined up treatment like we're trying to do where all the sites talk to each other every week and we know what's going on i basically take a phone call um with all the sites and um, myself and my colleagues we know we talk about every single child who's on cancer treatment every week so so that is uh, at the key to our success i believe so thank you very much for your uh, attention and your time and i'm very happy to take any questions and i'm sorry if i went on too long <laughs>